When your quite good supplement doesn't even match up to about halfway to creatine, you know that like testosterone boosters are in a bad way. Basically, these are not really test boosters, they're test teasers. They flirt with your endocrine system, whisper sweet mechanistic nothings in your ear, and then ghost you when it's squat day, which is kind of true. It sucks. So honestly, natural test boosters, and we've been saying this in the industry for a long time, just kind of don't work, you guys. Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for RP Strength, and today we're gonna talk about test boosters. Ways that you can take some kind of supplement, usually a natural one, and increase your testosterone, and thus increase your muscle mass, and maybe even get leaner. And the question today is, are test boosters hype, or are they fact, or are they hype? Let's find out. So I had um, an interaction with my doctor where he was like, hey, you have to stop using OpenAI's O3 model in AI to help do research for the video. And you know what I did? I slapped him across the face with my white glove that I calmly and carefully took off, slap, and told him, hell no. So I had a huge help in this from OpenAI's O3 product, which lives inside of the ChatGPT platform. And if ChatGPT could live inside of me or I inside of it, I think that would be ideal. But for now, this is good enough. I can't recommend these tools enough. However, after aggregating knowledge and filtering it through my science brain that I went to school for, put together this presentation for you. So today we have ooh, kind of a lot, five testosterone boosting supplements, okay, named testosterone boosting supplements. Do they do things? Do they not? Let's figure this out. And I'm going to be using some gold standards of comparison. Um, creatine is a supplement that actually works to gain muscle mass. And of all the supplements you can take that aren't like drugs or aren't just like more protein that you can get through food or through genius shots, am I right? Um, creatine's the best. It really is kind of the best muscle growth supplement there is. So on a ranking scale that ends in creatine at like 10, where do these kind of stack up? And um, fat loss, we can use the rank of 10 being terzepatide which is at five milligrams per week, kind of the gold standard fat loss drug. And, you know, like if these really do boost testosterone in a very meaningful way, you would think that they would be at least comparable to creatine in muscle growth potential and at least somewhere on the scale of terzepatide for fat loss potential. Scott, if I tell you a supplement could increase your testosterone and you think I'm not a charlatan, I'm being serious, do you think on average you would say it works less well than creatine, about as well as creatine, or at least better than creatine? Oh my God. And you're not a charlatan? <laughs> I'm not a charlatan. <laughs> I would say it would have to be better than creatine. Better than creatine, yeah. right? Like, because like you're messing with your hormones and you already pay money for creatine. Some of these supplements are more expensive. Let's find out how they stack up. So our first supplement is D-aspartic acid. And the hypothesized mechanism by which it works is probably like it increases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which has some downstream effects, and basically increases your natural testosterone production. And that's all cool, and it actually probably does do that, but reality has some roadblocks for us here. A lot of the very optimistic stuff that came out about diaspartic acid a while back was in animal studies. And animal studies are great, and they usually transfer very well to human studies, but not always. So ever since they started testing it in humans, they realized that it does have a testosterone-boosting effect, but then your own pituitary detects the higher testosterone and clamps it back down. So after about two weeks of taking it and getting a rise in testosterone that's actually quite small, usually for most people, the test goes just right back down to normal. And some randomized control trials in trained men who were taking diaspartic acid showed no change or even a slight drop in testosterone at six grams of the supplement per day, which is a robust dose. Get the cricket emojis going here. This is not good. The strength of the evidence isn't very high, which is a good thing if you think there's still maybe studies that are going to discover diaspartic acid is awesome. It's a bad thing if you think the supplement works well and you know science backs it, because that shit ain't true. There's one systematic review that basically found that it's promising in rats, uh, which is nice. Rats are very excited about this, and they're flexing in the mirror right now, shaving each other and picking up posing trunks. But uh, it basically the same systematic review find that's mostly inert in humans, like Scott, can you imagine paying money for this shit and you, you read that study and you're like, 
Damn it. I'm not a rat. Splinter is getting all kinds oh. of gays. Can we get Splinter thrown up on the screen? He's kind of jacked. That boy's on diaspartic acid for sure. And the effect magnitude in the best case would potentially be something like a 30% rise in serum testosterone if you are untrained and sleep deprived. And the chronic effect of diaspartic acid over enough of a time frame, weeks and weeks and weeks to grow appreciable muscle, hovers anywhere between zero and 5%. And actually, could hover into negative 5% because sometimes it reduces your testosterone production. So on the creatine scale, it doesn't even reach a one out of 10 on the potential to get you jacked side, which really, really sucks. Now, if you are a subfertile man, you need TRT. But if you don't have any TRT, this might help you in short bursts. Not entirely really sure why you would need that. But your adaptation of your body kills the bump that you get in test and brings it back down. The strength and body composition data are basically flat lines. Nothing's happening. And um, yeah, you're just consuming a cool tasting sour thing for pretty much no gains. So, so far, diaspartic acid, number one on our list, gets the big X, I think. Big red X. But there are more Avengers assembled. The first one got swatted away by the evil monster. The next one, though, has got crazy superpowers and is from Greece. And his name is Fenugreek, which I don't think has anything to do with Greece at all. But it's got Greece in the name. Allegedly, supposedly Fenugreek works by reducing your sex hormone binding globulin, liberating more free testosterone to do its cool testosterone things to your muscles, and might even inhibit aromatase and 5-alpha reductase enzymes, again, to give you more actual testosterone to do a good job with. But in reality, a lot of what you get with a supplement is a proprietary blends that may or may not have a certain amount of fenugreek in them. And you get usually tiny trials, fewer than 50 subjects, which you can conclude stuff with, but not a lot. And a lot of the studies are funded by companies selling the extract, which isn't a bad thing, but independent studies would be a really good thing to corroborate the evidence here. And it turns out the total body of evidence isn't very strong. I would give it like a three out of 10 or something like that, where a 10 would be creatine, whereas like hundreds and hundreds of studies all pointing in roughly the same direction. Um, the effect magnitude here is to see something like a 9 to 14% increase in free testosterone with a teeny barely detectable, but I guess detectable, increase in lean mass over something like eight weeks of novice lifting. And that gives it a rank on the creatine of, again, very low single digits, maybe a one, maybe a two out of 10, maybe even lower if you look at it from a certain perspective. You might see, like some of the subject studies, uh, su subjects in the study saw, a consistent uptick in a little bit of extra reps to failure and glycogen resynthesis. It's generally well tolerated, so you're probably not going to have any bad outcomes from this. But in free, uh, sorry, in, in untrained lifters, the effect shrinks substantially. And free testosterone bump is not big enough to really affect um, your strength or muscle mass in a huge way. And that's why we see that it kind of doesn't. The other thing is like, apparently your sweat can swell, uh, smell a little bit like maple syrup when you're on this. Scott, Ooh. have you ever made love to a man in a bedroom and like, just be like, Mao, you, you really do smell like maple syrup. And I love that. Yeah, that sounds like a plus. It's a huge plus. I'd take it just for that alone. <laughs> yeah, but that's it. And that's all you're going to get because it barely does anything at all. Again, 9 to 14% increase in free testosterone isn't something crazy to write home about. It could be effective. It's probably not bad for you, but it ranks way below creatine. Again, way below creatine on how much muscle it's going to get you in most cases, which again is like, and you're messing with your hormones for so little muscle, not ideal. So fenugreek, better than diaspartic acid probably, but still not amazing. Tribulus terrestris is our next one, number three. I've been around a while. I've heard about Tribulus for my entire uh, lifting career. And what it can do is it increases luteinizing hormone potentially to get your uh, testosterone produced more naturally by your balls. I believe that's the technical term. And, and the saponins that compose this thing are kind of maybe a raw steroid backbone on which your body can make more testosterone. But unfortunately, it, it runs into some roadblocks of its own. It has very poor oral bioavailability. So a lot of it, you're just not getting into your body. Most of the human trials show it doesn't do hardly anything. And if you take a higher dose to try to 
get the bioavailability uh, bio overcome, then you're likely to run into gastrointestinal issues. So it's kind of like just kind of hemmed in all over. The strength of the evidence is not very strong. There's a handful of randomized control trials, and the effect is largely null in athletes, like just not really anything happens. A recent study on erectile dysfunction, which I struggle with hourly, um, and you, the viewer, probably struggle with yourself. I know you. Come on. You're struggling. Stop. You know you are. Scott? No, never. My ever. Man. Ever, ever, ever. Um, people who have ED and they were older hypogonadal men, it did bring their testosterone up by 16%. But like if you're hypogonadal, you need like 2 or 3x the testosterone in most cases. 16% is not going to cut it. You're like still hypogonadal, just a little bit less. And so the effect magnitude on muscle gain here is approaching no detectability compared to creatine. So like if you tell someone tribulus terrestris gains you muscle, you're probably more incorrect than you are correct. Um, I mean, if you have less than 300 or 350 nanograms per deciliter of testosterone, which means you need TRT, by the way, you can get a modest improvement in libido and erectile function from tribulus potentially. But like, that's such a very different thing than being pretty normal and healthy and athletic and trying to get more jacked that I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Um, O3 calls it like ergogenic fairy dust at best. Um, and I tend to agree with that. So yeah, if you're looking for results, tribulus terrestris is probably not the place you're going to be getting them. For muscle growth, that's for damn sure. Next up is a little sleeper. It's ashwagandha again. And we've done videos on ashwagandha before, and it actually looks like it works. And it does. It's an adaptogen. It lowers cortisol. It has some uh, luteinizing hormone activity. It's an antioxidant potentially. And it has GABAergic stuff, so it interacts with the brain. Some really, really good stuff there. And especially its cortisol reduction is a big, big deal. But remember, cortisol seeks to kind of reduce your muscularity. Testosterone seeks to increase it. So ashwagandha actually doesn't seem to boost your testosterone much. What it does is most of its beneficial effects come from reducing cortisol. That it does quite well. Uh, probably a 5 out of 10 on strength of the evidence. Multiple randomized control trials. There's even a systematic um, review, sorry, a narrative review, which we actually uh, are covering on this channel as well. Either did or will. We already have filmed that video. And the magnitude of effect is um, probably like the best of these botanical supplements. It is still much smaller than creatine, but it's something. It maybe in some studies can be interpreted as a, like a 5 out of 10 on the creatine scale. So this is some cool stuff. And it does have reproducible perks on reducing stress. If you are sleep deprived, it can help you experience less cortisol and all that stuff. And it can have some synergies there, but if your stress is well managed, your gains plateau out pretty fast, and it's just not a thing that even really increases your testosterone enough to do all those, you know, testosterone boosting things. So it's more of like a testosterone effects modulator than it is a testosterone booster, which is why it does make our list and is actually quite good. But again, it doesn't even, when your quite good supplement doesn't even match up to about halfway to creatine, you know that like testosterone boosters are in a bad way, but don't worry, we have one that sucks even more. Just kidding, but it sucks. The old Tongkat Ali, which I just thought was someone's name, but apparently is a supplement. It might increase luteinizing hormone, it might release bound testosterone, it might blunt sex hormone binding globulin, and it might lower your cortisol a little bit. And there's a lot of mites there because there are very few high quality human trials. There are variable alkaloid concentrations in products that they actually put out in the market of this. You're not really 100% sure where you're getting any time. And there are real but rare reports of liver toxicity in the actual literature of people taking it. So like you're getting not a whole lot of anything, but you're getting a hurt liver is really, really bad news. The evidence strength isn't terrible. It's a three out of 10. There's a 22, 2022 meta-analysis that is available. It's small, but causes a significant rise of testosterone. And here's the thing, in middle-aged men, you can see 30 to 100 nanogram per deciliter rise in testosterone. 100 nanograms per deciliter, that's pretty trippy. However, unfortunately, the body composition data is functionally negligible, which means, yes, it can boost your testosterone a little bit, but it doesn't seem, at least in the studies we have so far, to have really yielded a lot of fat loss or a lot of muscle gain. Let me say that differently. 
detectable fat loss or detectable muscle gain, which is much worse than a lot because it's maybe hardly anything at all. Now, it might boost your libido, your sex drive, which is cool if you want to bang more. That's fun. It might increase your mood a little bit, and it might make your stress markers better. But, um, and, you know, and they've been using this a long time in Southeast Asia, so we know it doesn't just kill people for no reason. But um, unfortunately, in eugonadal athletes, folks that are not hypogonadal, it has almost no effect, and it seems to not grow muscle. And the liver enzymes worth monitoring is a thing I would say is worth the trade-off for like oral anabolic steroids or SARMs. But like, you know, with something like Ligandrol, that's a really effective SARM, you're going to get like, well, I don't know, a hundred times or an infinity times more muscle gain from this. I mean, Ligandrol grows more muscle than creatine does, and it does have a liver effect. And I would say if you have a comparable liver conversation in your head about something that has arguably no effect on muscle gains versus something that is revolutionary for muscle gains, I, why are you taking that one thing? Why would you take Tonkat Ali? You could take it for maybe a little stress management, maybe a little libido boost or something like that. Again, these aren't very big effects either, but at least they're detectable. For muscle gain, I just wouldn't even bother with the shit because it's probably going to do a whole lot of nothing at all. So if we look over our whole list, boy, it's really hard to make this seem good. So just to go through it really quick, I'm going to scroll all the way back up. Diaspartic acid is a flat fat. I wouldn't take it. Fenugreek, you can take. Um, it, it's just not going to do a whole lot, but it's not bad for you, and it's worth a try, maybe, if you have spare money. Tribulus terrestris is a gigantic waste of your money and time. Ashwagandha is actually a fine supplement, but don't expect it to revolutionize your gains and boost your testosterone through the roof. And Talqat Ali functionally does nothing at all. So that's kind of the summary. And what O3, the AI from ChatGPT or OpenAI said about this was basically these are not really test boosters, they're test teasers. Uh, they don't really do a whole lot. The joke that OpenAI's uh, O3 model said is they flirt with your endocrine system, whisper sweet mechanistic nothings in your ear, and then ghost you when it's squat day, which is kind of true. It sucks. They're at a 90% hype, 10% hazard. Uh, so it's unlikely they're going to screw you up, but it's very unlikely you'll have any kind of benefit at all. Ashwagandha aside, really, none of these supplements really make my list of anything you can take. And the ashwagandha stuff doesn't even really work through the testosterone pathway. So honestly, natural test boosters, and we've been saying this in the industry for a long time, just kind of don't work, you guys. These either get TRT, get you TRT plus, if you know what I mean, which means, you know, the other side of the dark side aisle. And, and, and other than that, man, you know, good sleep, good food, good recovery, good stress management is the way to keep your test levels really, really high. Um, creatine costs a nickel a day. Uh, it'll never file for divorce and it'll whisper not sweets. Nothing's in your ear, but sweet anabolic somethings. Get you some creatine, get you some protein, get you jacked, take the test boosters, throw them in the garbage. Better yet, don't buy them at all because throwing money in the garbage is a bad idea. You guys like test boosters? Yay. I'm going to give them a nay. Comments, see you there. And I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>